Today we are going to be discussing a very important character in the game Final Fantasy Type-0. And one can also argue that this character is also very important in the Final Fantasy series as a whole. Today we will be talking about the great Gilgamesh! And I'm only going to say it like that once because I'm going to be saying his name a lot. But here we go. Anyway, one of the first things I want to bring up with in Type-0 is that the first question would be, is this Gilgamesh the same Gilgamesh as in the series? Some people have said it is, like me, and some people say it's not because, you know, they can't believe he'd ever be this freaking awesome. But anyway, let's get into it. Um, there are various, various factors that allude to this being the same Gilgamesh. And let's start with Gilgamesh himself. You know, this is hairstyle. It has that samurai Musashi ponytail hairstyle that he usually has in all his appearances. He's also wearing exotic armor like he usually does in all his appearances. And if you fight him enough times by replaying missions involving him, you can get Genji equipment from him, or you're awarded with Genji equipment, I should say. But Genji equipment is a very is a theme with him that you can get from him, and it's usually the strongest armor in the game, if not one of these most strongest in the armor. If it's not the strongest, it's usually the second or third best, and specializes in magic resistance, which alludes to what. Lorca's Crystal does. It specializes in offense and defense, but mainly it negates magic by a crap ton, and this is very important. Furthermore, unmasked, you can see his face and his facial features, and it looks very similar to the Gilgamesh in Final Fantasy XI, which would... which depending on perspective, can be seen as the same one, but in a lesser role. Just later the pirates and whatnot, but they look really similar, including hairstyle and the way it's set up. But um, if you also look at his face, you can also see that he has those tribal facial markings those war markings, and if you compare them with the Final Fantasy V version and other versions, you can see those markings are very similar, and with the Final Fantasy V version, you can see they are pretty much the exact same thing, exact same placement, and everywhere, and it it's a, a di di direct link, see, I can't talk today, because uh, it's so fascinating. Um, continuing on, Another thing to notice is that he he has, he he has a more form, and I have a theory on how this comes to be, but we're gonna get into that later. Um, he has the same Japanese voice actor, uh, Kazu, that Nakai guy. I can't pronounce his first name, but um, same voice actor. Um, when you battle him, he has the classic Clash on the Big Bridge battle theme. They used to the city of version, but it can be argued that maybe the Type-0 that this version was composed at the same time. I don't know. That's what I've heard a couple times. But, um, yeah. the And his home of that he evidently rules that I learned a long while ago. He's not just a general of the nation. He's their king, which is big for me. But, um, Basically, his home. If you look, if you look at it, it's full of big bridges everywhere, just everywhere. And I think this is just drawing that thing where he is inexorably drawn to big bridges when you battle him because they were always around him in his home country, and it means something to him, I guess. But that's another thing to take into consideration. And another thing is that he does have a body, he does have Enkidu, and we'll get into that stuff in a little bit. But, and he does not mention Bart's Clauser because also we're going to get to that in a little bit. 
because it's very important that it's not about after meeting Bart's Clouser, it's before meeting Bart's Clouser. So now that we've drawn these conclusions of these similarities and basically said this is pretty much the same Gilgamesh, we are going to get into the story aspects of Type Zero as a game and how it correlates to Gilgamesh, the character. And since I'm going to be discussing the story, there's bound to be spoilers, so if you don't want to be spoiled for this game that was released in the end of October in 2011, then I suggest you leave. First off, let's start with me reading off his official character profile from the game itself, and then we'll get into the story as told from my interpretation on how it affects Gilgamesh. So, here we go. In Type Zero, his full name is Gilgamesh Ashal, but it might be a mistranslation of Ashur, which was an Assyrian war god, if I recall correctly. His age is unknown, and he's roughly 220 centimeters high. He has forgotten his focus and is known as the Rampaging LC, or Light Warrior of the Genbu Crystal. Once he appears on the battlefield, he challenges all. Then it talks about the Lore Communion. It says, in the Lore Communion, home of the Genbu Crystal, ordinary humans are bolstered by the power of the crystal, thus gaining a body that does not falter easily to arms or magic. For this reason, people of the Lore Communion are much sturdier than those of other nations. Furthermore, they can forge armor with the power of the crystal. By encasing themselves in this armor, they become warriors who far excel any human able to withstand weapons as strong as Magitech armor. Such strength is the pride of Genbu. The Genbu Peristilium, which is basically their capital, home base, stuff like that, keeps the Genbu Crystal within the underground royal palace. Its power there is controlled directly in name of the king and only by the king. In the warrior nation, of the Lorica Union, one who does not display great strength cannot become king. Likewise, the warrior chosen as king is also made into a LC by the crystal, also known as a warrior of light. Gilgamesh's father was the king, making Gilgamesh the successor to the throne when the king died, being the direct, the direct heir. As a result of this, the people distrusted him, assuming he was taking advantage of his position as the king's son. Even after proving his worth in a battle for the position of king, it was difficult to change public opinion, and tensions flared within the royal family over the years. In the year 832, an action spurred by a coup d'etat, or to overthrow something, in the Militus Empire, an uprising ignited in Gembu. Basically, Gembu want, the Gembu people who were against Gilgamesh wanted to do that too. The rebellion was quelled by the loyal Enkidu, Gilgamesh's best friend, who gave his life in the battle. Afterwards, Gilgamesh was stricken with grief and sadness, as Enkidu's last will and testament an appropriate punishment was doled out. The leaders of the insurrection were banished from the nation. Banishment and exile instead of killing them outright. This is a thing that goes in with Gilgamesh's I'll take your weapons and I'll spare your life kind of thing. Continuing on, after this event, Gilgamesh was chosen as an LC and became king, the strongest Lorca had ever seen. And then, at the end of his profile, it makes a little footnote that of there is a rumor of a LC seen on Gilgamesh's side who has 
been gathering shining stones. However, this remains a rumor. What that alludes to is another Genbu Warrior of Light in Type 0. That Warrior of Light's name is Atora, and he continues to find what are known as LC Pyroxenes, which I dubbed LC Magicite, because why not? And it's unclear why he's collecting them, but he also appears in other places too, and it's like, why are you even here, and stuff like that. Continuing on, how the story plays out is that in the Ultimania, I don't think it's ever directly stated in the game itself, but Lorica had been fighting the Militus Empire for a month at the same time the Militus Empire went to attack Suzaku and got repelled. At the end of this month duration, the Militus Empire released their secret weapon known as the Ultima Bomb. And the Ultima Bomb is exactly like an atomic bomb. It was dropped and it completely wiped out the country of Lorica off the face of the planet called Orients. And like an alt like an atomic bomb, the Ultima Bomb might also emit radiation when it goes off. And in the manga adaptation, Gilgamesh is seen being obli obliterated by it at point blank range. So one can assume that not only was he hit by it, but he was also he also may have been affected by what I term Ultima Radiation. And that might be the forthcoming of his morph form, how it comes to be, stuff like that. And I think after that, with all that stress and drama of his country being obliterated and him being bombarded by this bomb, he basically lost his memory or lost it entirely. And that's pretty much what happened then. We don't really see much of anything of them for a while. And basically, all the other nations just assume that everyone in Lorica died, it's wiped off the planet, and no one goes to claim that territory because there weren't really any resources they could use, and, if, and I think the Ultima Bomb probably got rid of a ton of them <laughs> if there was any left. And there are after effects of the Ultima Bomb because you can see enemies are larger than normal and really strong and it's just not a safe place to be. Moving on, later in what is termed as the Orient's War, I guess, or maybe Pax Codex War, I'm not sure. Um, there's a battle at the big bridge there's these two sets of bridges, and they're rather long, and they connect pieces of land. And it's basically the Suzaku border and the Militus border. Anyway, there's this huge battle that goes on, and Suzaku's preparing their own secret weapons. Like, we don't want you to use yours, so we, we're going to strike you first. But anyway, as the heroes in this game, you hear yelling and screaming over the radio channel saying that the Suzaku forces have encountered something. They don't know what it is, but it's absolutely massacred them. And as you approach the big bridge, a group of Ifrits fall down from the sky like something had totally annihilated them, launched them up, and they just freaking fell down. And you approach and reach the big bridge, and upon an entire battalion of huge Magitek armored vehicles they're destroyed, and standing on top of them is the king of Lorica himself, Gilgamesh. And he's talking out loud and saying, he doesn't know where he is, he doesn't know who he is, he doesn't know, he doesn't have a clue. And then he looks at you, and... He says something to the effect that he, um, he covets, and he wants to take, and he wants to destroy and devour everything. And that's when he goes to fight you by 
ejecting a freaking huge sword that it's it's pretty much he's going all berserk guts on you because he has this ridiculously large sword that puts many characters weapons in the Final Fantasy series to shame it's pretty much as thick as most Swahanders can come and it's probably about as long as Sephiroth's Massimoon if not longer and it's just utterly ridiculous and he swings it with one hand and it's like whoa but anyway no matter how good you do if you win or lose he totally kicks your ass and he basically says well if you're not going to put up a good enough fight I'm not going to continue fighting you and he proceeds to walk off like a boss and then one of your characters is like Basically, where the hell are you going and what's your problem and all that kind of stuff. And Lerman's like, well, we have to retreat because this guy's like a badass and stuff. And anyway, soon after, Suzaku unleashes its secret weapon. A forbidden or concealed great summon known as Alexander. And what happens is that basically the same thing that happened with Lorica. Milita's bulk of their forces is wiped out completely, vaporized into nothing. We don't know if Gilgamesh was in the way, or if he blocked it, or whatever. In any case, later on, he reaches the Militus capital, and he, chal he challenges this mysterious Militus LC, and by my interpretation, since I'm assuming he did block that attack from Alexander, he is likely very wore out from the battles he's been doing nonstop. So in the end, he loses against this LC, and it's unknown if he lost on purpose or wasn't strong enough or whatever. But what happened before is really interesting because he gets a flashback that makes him remember his old friend that protected him, Enkidu, from the coup d'etat or whatever, the overthrowing thing. And they talk about you can't just have power and that you need to have government to have proper law and order. And Gilgamesh basically said he doesn't care what the council members that he had around thought of him and that he was going to protect his country, but that didn't happen, so he's asking his friend, even though he's dead, to forgive him. And basically, he fought this mysterious LC because he has a death wish, and, you know, he's not going to off himself. He wants someone else to do it for him. So, he goes, he battles, I guess they pull up a decent fight, but he still loses. He yells in pain, and he's tries to say he is Genbu's whatever, but he eventually falls on his knees. Now, this can be taken one of two ways. You can assume that he died, or you can also assume that he was dragged down to the dimensional rift. Because as it plays out, before you fight, he has this sort of darkness emanating around him, and even circular even by his feet. And it just makes me wonder, maybe after he lost, he was consumed by his own power that he had as a light warrior, and was dragged into the interdimensional rift, and the powers that be will make him survive, for whatever reason. And that's really all I can say about that, because when you, play, when you replay the game several times, you can eventually fight him in his multi-armed form with a crap ton of weapons that he got from somewhere. I don't know if he pulled them out of his ass or he beat up some people and took them. But some of them seem to be of Lorcan design, so I'm assuming he just found them somewhere or something. But when you play the game and you go through the final dungeon, you go through a thing that kind of alludes to the Lorcans did indeed were fighting the Militus Empire for a month because you face a mockery of Gilgamesh that 
It isn't the same Gilgamesh, but voices his thoughts, like how much he hates whatever, or how much he dislikes the bright light, which could refer to the crystal, which I guess he disdained because he was more for the people instead of do everything for the crystal, and I guess that pissed the crystal off, or whatever. And he also mentions his devour everything line, so it's really interesting. But um, evidently he survives, and in the credits you see he has discarded his old armor and his old weapons. So I think that was a uh, goodbye note to his nation, that he didn't deserve to keep these things because he failed to protect his country. He knows that, and he has to walk away from it, and if he can't live as a king of a nation, then maybe he should try living as a man. And let's be honest, with the whole radiation thing going on that I've come up with and how he has his morph form, can you really call him a person anymore? He's more... He's... Well, that's just it. He's something more. He's... The only thing that could really describe him is his name. He's simply Gilgamesh. And that's how it is. And I would assume that he just keeps on going and he lives through centuries and he's looking for legendary weapons to take because he has that mindset from his people that he needs to display his strength. He needs to find power and him finding power translates to him to finding weapons of great power and that's how it's been going down ever since. And I just think that to put him as the king and correlate everything to the epic Gilgamesh and how everyone from that nation was named after someone from the epic of Gilgamesh is just amazing and I just love it. And I just love how they made him so freaking awesome. In one early screenshot, they had him uh, with his sword out on the big bridge and his dialogue said, basically, show me your strength. I wield the strongest weapon there is. I shall strike down all who stand before me. But that was cut for whatever reason. But um, yeah, it was really awesome. And but yeah, I think this really uh elaborates more and makes Gilgamesh the most dynamic character in the entire series. It makes everyone look like crap. I mean, it really def it definitely makes everyone from Final Fantasy 13 look like crap. And if I'm bashing on 13, just to bash on 13, I will do that because I hate that series so much. It should be its own little thing. Probably would have done so much better as a separate intellectual property. But no, we had to have that use the Final Fantasy name for, you know, name recognition. But it is what it is. But the fact of the matter is, Gilgamesh and Type-0 is awesome. And... Yeah, well, um, that's pretty much all I have to say on the matter. It's just that I hope Gilgamesh appears more, and I'm looking forward to what happens in Final Fantasy XIV. I'm not going to play Final Fantasy XIV because I don't play Final Fantasy MMOs. I don't justify um buying something then having to pay a monthly fee. So yeah, but can't wait to see what happens with that because I love everything Gilgamesh and Gilgamesh will be a specific line quest as in there's a bunch of quests that are specifically about him and that's going to be awesome and you know I don't have much of an opinion on lightning returns but if Gilgamesh is in that game if he appears in that game great I'll I'll be interested in that but I don't know yeah, that's pretty much my analysis on Gilgamesh and Type-0, and I hope you enjoyed what I had to say, and I'll talk to everyone later. Bye!